So Alan Willoughby just got off the Golden Rule, and how was it for you? A uh, very meaningful experience. I think uh, on the way over here, I was thinking about how it's been um, 65 years since the Golden Rule originally set sail out into the Pacific, and my father being a part of that, and it took me 65 years to finally get on the boat. But it's uh, thanks to Veterans for Peace, uh, it's become a possibility and um, has continued to carry forth the message. So that's pretty, pretty impressive, pretty amazing. Seen, I've seen uh, many pictures of the Golden Rule, but actually seeing it in person, it seems so much smaller. <laughs> but yet, going out on the river, it's uh, a really, uh, it's like a, sort of like a tugboat a little bit. It's a really well built. You can feel it's really solid even though it's not, you know, it's so small, basically, for the sailing that it's done. Larry, Larry Huntington, son, uh, nephew of Bill Huntington. What a, what a pleasure to uh, spend an afternoon uh, out on the Hudson River on the Golden Rule, uh, a meaningful, uh, a, a meaningful vessel in many, many different ways and a wonderful opportunity to uh, share with others today uh, celebrating the rebirth of this of this vessel and all it stands for just great what an extraordinary experience to be on the golden rule with this history <laughs> that goes back into the purpose for which it was built and what it sailed and to go right into the middle of the united states atomic testing and say stop and in my mind that's what this little boat still represents. It's the little ship with a lot of power saying stop to this government, stop the wars and stop the arms races and stop the nuclear race to oblivion. Thanks, Susan Schnell. Hello, thank you all for coming. Let's stand back here. Um, I'm Ruth Ben and I'm active with New York City War Resisters League. And um, we also are pleased to be co-hosting this event tonight with uh, Pete, the Peace and Social Justice Committee um, and are so grateful for the Golden Rule folks to be here in New York. Um, we will hear from a few people and some family members of the original crew. And we'll also have a question and answer period after the speakers. So you can hold out for that with your questions that you might have. Um, so our first speaker this evening is Joanne Sheehan, who has been a peace activist for a long time now. Not the full hundred years of the War Resisters League, but a good chunk of it. <laughs> She's come down from Norwich, Connecticut today. She is the staff person for War Resisters League New England. Uh, which began in 1984. And before that, she also lived at the Community for Nonviolent Action. And she'll tell you how they're involved in the history of the Golden Rule. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm really, you know, I've been organizing, well, over 50 years with War Resisters League. But for almost a year, we have also been planning the visit of the Golden Rule in New London and Groton, in a historic area where there have been protests going on there. Um, started by the CNBA, which originally was the Nonviolent Action Committee that really was the foundation for the Golden Rule. Um, so I feel steeped in this history, um, kind of a, a history buff because I'm also a nonviolence trainer and um, feel like we need to understand the strategy of how movements happen and kind of get that full story out so that we can continue to create social change based on um, based on these wonderful inspirations. I think the golden rule is one of them. Um, you know, one of the, the foundation of War Resisters League is that we believe that war is a crime against humanity. And I think it was very clear on Hiroshima Day on August 6, 1945, that Albert Bigelow understood that at that point in time, which is why he gave up his commission, as we heard in the, um, in the film. WRL's declaration goes on to talk about action, um, are um, working nonviolently for the removal of the causes of war. And I think that's kind of the important thing is really getting involved in the action aspects of this. 
And so while many people we know um, and have heard of were very upset, moved, uh, opposed to what was happening in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and with the buildup of nuclear weapons, it was really uh, kind of individual actions of resistance, individual actions of, by groups like Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I remember hearing stories of them, um, not just have, not everyone had, had, had a machine to be able to um, find out if there's radiation in the milk, but so many kids growing up having powdered milk because the strontium 90 was much reduced in powdered milk. So just kind of how people were living through that. But the ban the bomb, move, ban the bomb movement really began um, to grow in many ways right here in New York City with folks that many of us have been inspired by um, with the first protests against the civil defense drills that took place here in New York City. Um, so the first demonstrations were in 1955. The um, civil defense drills started the year before and people from the Catholic Worker, War Resisters League, Fellowship of Reconciliation and the Peacemakers got together and refused to duck and cover during those air raid drills when people were supposed to go into the basements and into the subway systems. And so and I'm inspired by, there were 28 people arrested including Dorothy Day, Ralph DeGia, Bayard Rustin, um, Jim Peck, who we saw in the film and eventually became one of the crew, were all arrested in City Hall Park for refusing to go in, to, to go and duck and cover. And then the next year it grew, and the next year it grew, and that by 1962, the city of New York had to stop this ridiculousness of pretending that somehow we could um, we could survive nuclear war by going into the subway system of New York City, and they finally ended those drills. So people kind of spoke up and said, no, we're not going to believe this kind of thing. I, um, I went through the minutes. One of the ways to kind of begin to find some of this history is I went through the minutes of the War Resisters League from 1957 and 1958, which thankfully were on the stage at Mary House for some reason. <laughs> WL moved. We somehow dropped exactly those years there. Um, and so the, the first note um, that I found that was beginning to kind of begin to tell this story of the golden rule, although probably some earlier things there, um, were uh, May 6, 1957, um, began to give a hint where it said H-bomb test. It was noted that opposition to the test is mounting throughout the world. And then in his book, the Voyage of the Golden Rule, um, Bert Bigelow writes that the idea to sail into the testing site first appeared that spring in 1957, when Harold Steele, who was a British pacifist, had the idea to sail into the United Kingdom testing area, which were the, Chris the Christmas islands. The Steeles and the folks who tried to put that together from England were not able to organize it in time but it was the spark that Bigelow talked about. So I was interested in Arnie Albert, if people are kind of interested in reading more of this, Arnie wrote a, a great piece in Waging Nonviolence about a month ago. Um, Arnie, um, Arnie asked me what I, what I knew of him. And so I wrote to the War Resisters International uh, listserv and asked around. And the editor of Peace News sent pages and pages and pages of articles that had appeared in Peace News about the steel. So probably one of the ways, and I think one of the lessons here is even before social media, we had Peace News, we had Peacemakers, we had WRL, we had a lot of networks of people who knew one another and of publications that were sent down on a really regular basis where people were able to exchange ideas, hear what else was happening. So undoubtedly knowing, particularly Bayard Rustin had strong connections, David McReynolds, a lot of our folks had strong connections with the, with the pacifist movement in the UK. Um, and I'm sure the publications also are coming in and, and sharing that information. Then in June, um, there is a report that representative, there's a report in the executive minutes, representatives of War Resisters League, FOR, Fellowship of Reconciliation, American Friends Service Committee, and WILP, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, met in May 
and after exhaustive discussions, any of you in the movement know what that means, after exhaustive discussions, set up a joint ad hoc committee, the Nonviolent Action Against Nuclear Tests. So that was the original NBA. If anybody's read um, Bigelow's book, he talks a lot about them in there. Lauren Scott, who was formerly the AFSC Peace Secretary in Chicago, was selected their director. And they had tentative plans, including civil disobedience action at the Nevada test site. And in his book, Bigelow writes, it became clear that we would have to go to Nevada. In June, we organized an ad hoc committee. So that was the first hint that I got that actually he had also been part of not just kind of seeing the nonviolent um, action folks as a support committee, but one of the people who helped create that very committee and, and was very involved in that. And then um, we know that he went on and um, participated in that group's very first action at the Nevada test site. Um, and then he writes in his book, we knew something of the theory, but very little about the practice of nonviolence when we went to Nevada. So I actually had to think about that a little. Um, and, um, and in reading that, what dawned on me was is that most of his training had been in the Navy. And that, 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 but there were other people who were part of that action who had actually been doing nonviolence training. And I'm sure this group of pacifists who got arrested looked very different than the people who were trained in the military. But yet I just want to shout out that people involved in that action included Jim Peck, who was very deeply involved in nonviolence, had been one of the early members of Congress of Racial Equality, which is one of the first groups that started doing nonviolence training. And Lillian Willoughby was also one of the people in that action. Um, and two of her children are here. And um, I, as I understand it, she was also by that point in time, deeply involved in, in nonviolent action. So um, many of the nonviolent action people had already been kind of experiencing that Bard Rustin had started doing trainings actually 10 years before for the journey of reconciliation. And, and Lauren Scott was also somebody who was deeply committed to nonviolent action and to preparing people and, and training for that. Um, the um, the, the uh, next WRL executive minutes of September talked about a request to the league for doing a nonviolence training center in, um, in Nevada and kind of looking at how, how can we prepare more people for doing these kinds of actions. And then the first note really about the golden rule here by the end of the year, which has obviously kind of been inspired by the Nevada action um, at, at, at right at the test site, blocking the entrance to the test site um, was called the Pacific Project. Um, and at that time, they were looking at both going into the Pacific with the golden rule, but also doing a, uh, as they called it, a deputation to Russia, to be going actually in both directions around the world to be doing this and to be doing it somewhat in different ways. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the headline of the, or the, the um, yeah, the headline in the WRL News of January and February said the urgency of peace in the Sputnik era. era. And it's kind of interesting to see how much the, as pacifists, they were really thinking about how would they address this issue? How would they, how would this message land on people given that Sputnik had gone up, the Russians were ahead of us. This was clearly a, an arms race that was building up between the two. And how does our voice get get heard in the middle of that. Um, a, about a month later, AJ Musty went out west um, to the west coast to meet up with the Golden Rule crew. By that point, the boat had already gone out. It hit the storm, had been damaged, had to come back. Um, one of the crew members, David Gale, found out that he was very seasick and couldn't continue. So they needed to replace another crew member um, but I think that um, with somebody like AJ Musty going out again, kind of a, a strategist, someone really thinking about kind of how to help kind of both get them back out and inspired again, um, and kind of also looking at kind of this, this bigger picture and these networks. And so 
as uh, I think probably the story that we most know is that they attempted to go out and they were um, they were arrested for violating an injunction against them doing that. Um, and thanks to their persistence and resistance, they continued to attempt to do that and eventually spent 60 days in jail for doing that. Um, that the Phoenix, sometimes things just happen as they're supposed to. The Phoenix pulls up a few slips down um, with the Reynolds on it, as is in the film. Um, and, and then they both participate in going to the trial and, and then going, um, going out to see themselves and getting fairly far before they were stopped. At the same time, what's happening is that there are actions that are spurred by the golden rule all over the world. And part of it, the, another article on the golden rule by George Lakey talked about kind of the media aspect that they're able to get. But I, and I think that it was probably both the, the newspapers were clearly picking this up and reporting that, but again, our own networks of folks because demonstrations happened immediately. As soon as they're arrested, within a few days, demonstrations happened in seven cities in this country and in Toronto. And so that just shows what kind, with phone calls, <laughs> what kind of networks existed among the Quakers, War Resisters League, FOR, Peacemakers, Women's International League. And some of these folks are kind of overlap it, right? It's, I think it's really important because so often we now think of these silos of people or silos of issues, right? So when I say Bayard Rustin, the Quakers go, Bayard, you know? <laughs> Worry Sisters, they goes, yes, he was on our staff, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like, you know? Um, and so I think that um, it's important to remember the interconnection, the friendships, the deep relationships among people in these organizations and among the networks of folks locally who would then be going out and demonstrating and who were deeply committed to doing this kind of work. There was a walk for peace that's talked about in both the War Resisters League and, and the Peacemaker publications where up to 900 people descended on Washington and some of them walked for days. Grace Peely wrote a a piece about that in the June 1958 liberation. The other thing that um, took place um, during the time that, um, that the crew was in jail was that there was a demonstration at the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, um, and that they quickly, nonviolent action folks quickly organized um, a demonstration to take place there, um, a sit-in that apparently both Ralph DeGia and this, this is terrible. So this is this kind of still the invisibility of women at that point, because it said there was a family member of one of the crew. And I'm guessing it was Lillian Willoughby who was the family member of the crew. Hmm? It was you. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't your mother. Too. <laughs> I love it. Great. Great. I'm sorry you didn't get in, in that newsletter. <laughs> I'm glad you're here to do that, to say that. Um, and so, um, and so these actions continued, right? The demonstrations, the arrests, the kind of putting that kind of pressure on the government, not just about the golden rule folks. I mean, being in prison is kind of one of the things we know is one of the things that happens, right? But around the issues, never let go of what that issue is in terms of atmospheric testing, strategically understanding that that was their weakest vulnerability, right? Because of the kids, because of we beginning to understand what radiation does, right? Um, and so that constant focus on that, at the same time, never giving up that view of the importance of, of full nuclear disarmament. The other important piece about this, as I said, was is that there was the golden rule in the water at the same time. And it seems to me from what I've read, um, kind of um, organized at, at, around the same time was this um, European project, which was a um, which was basically by a Rustin leading a delegation of a total of five people and going um, to first to England, going to to major countries in Europe on their way to try to get into the Soviet Union. 
And so their first stop was in the UK and they went to the Aldermaston demonstration. Now, some of us know this story because at Aldermaston was the first time that the peace symbol was used. That Gerald Huston designed the peace symbol and ND, nuclear disarmament, which wasn't known as the peace symbol and really until kind of the Vietnam era. Um, but with the semaphore N and D in a circle. Um, and it was used at that demonstration. And Byard spoke at that demonstration and brought the peace symbol home. That's a story I always knew until the last month or so when it only became clear that this was a coordinated effort along with the golden rules sailing in the Pacific to bring that message to the, to the European countries and, and to the Soviet Union. And I think, well, again, one of the things that the pacifists were very good at back then um, was having that balance of looking at, yes, we have to do something here in our own home, but we also have to reach out. So then you saw later, for example, the NBA becoming the CNBA, the committee, and then the Community for Nonviolent Action, organizing the San Francisco to Moscow walk and doing those kinds of actions where we're doing something here, but we're also trying to, to say something there. And so, um, so making kind of those connections, again, I think are um, and important as we look at these as being really international issues. There is a, um, a series of four or five articles in the June 1958 Liberation Magazine um, where Bayard talks, and Bayard is one of the authors, um, I think William Huntington is, Jim Peck is, is a, Grace Paley I think was also one in there. Um, and one of the things, I just wanna read one of the paragraphs in Bayard's piece because um, I think it, it, it's, it spoke to me in a lot of ways. Bayard says, in essence, then, the central problem facing the peace movement is that of creating a political form through which it can express itself on both domestic and foreign policy. In no such political form, if, if no such political form is created, the peace walks and demonstrations will have had no practical meaning but will prove to have, they have only been a futile protest, kind of broken, faltering voice raised against the ominous thunder of rockets and H-bombs. And I would say that's still our challenge. It's our challenge to be strategic. It's our challenge to be focused. Um, it's our challenge at the same time that Bayard was um, being asked by War Resisters League to increasingly get involved in the Golden Rule. Um, the minutes noted that he had been down in Atlanta with Martin Luther King Jr. in 1957 um, on a campaign for voter registration drives. And so when George Willoughby was put on the, was, was uh, made one of the crew members and he'd been chairman of the fundraising for the Golden Rule. Then they asked Bayard to kind of step in and kind of do a little double time of both the Golden Rule and the campaign on voter registration in order to raise that money um, to, to get the boat out and to do the kind of campaigning that was needed. So um, I think that one of the, um, one of the best um, headlines in the WL News, which is in the May-June one, is talking about how the golden rule spurs actions against nuclear weapons around the country. And I think that's the kind of thing that we want to see with these kinds of actions, is that it's not just what you do there, here, in this little bubble, but how that kind of gets, gets other, um, other actions going, other folks going. And I think that that's the um, the, the message, uh, the powerful message of the, the golden rule now is to do that again, right? That this is a really good time with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, a good time for people to be able to kind of focus on kind of moving that forward, seeing ourselves in connection, particularly to the less powerful nations around the world who have really stepped in um, and and allowed that to be um, to be ratified, given the the large numbers of them, that we really see that the golden rule this time around really spurs actions for folks to understand the real need to 
stop nuclear weapons. Thanks. Um, we do have some family members uh, from the original crew. So George Willoughby was one of the original crew members and also William Huntington. And in the slides, you can see them kind of on the ship there. Uh, so um, they have a few words to say. And Anita, I think you're going to start first. Anita Willoughby and Alan, oh, there you are. And uh, Larry Huntington, you're here. I assume. Okay, and you can maybe, Larry is um, the nephew of William Huntington. And so when after, after the Willoughby's, you could just come up. Oh, thank you. I feel like I've just relived my history. All the names, you have um, much more of a chronological understanding of my history. I have all those images that we saw and I was a part of many of them as was my family members but I really don't have a sense when it all started. Um, I would say that being in this meeting house brings back also a lot of memories. So this whole trip today is down memory lane. Okay, so I was 10 years old uh, when my father <clears throat> was on the Golden Rule. And we moved from Iowa when I was five and it was a bit of a shock. I didn't want to leave Iowa. <laughs> now I'm so grateful I did. Um, I love the East Coast, but it was a very different environment for us. And my parents, and they worked together in tandem, the two of them, each supporting each other in this vision that they had. And they were the best teachers. I was thinking this morning that I learned everything I needed to learn for life in the early years from my parents. And some of those things were values and meaning and having courage, courage of your convictions. And they had an, an immense amount of courage. Mind you, it wasn't a perfect household, but they taught me the best tricks in my life, my father and mother in their protesting. I think um, every single vacation we went on, had something to do with the protest, except when we went to see my grandparents in Iowa. So my joke is uh, when we're going, uh, honey, remember the signs. Okay, so, but as a child, I actually found it exciting in some ways because it was sort of contagious, the sense of much of a larger than just our nuclear family. There was a purpose and a meaning. And it, it, it was difficult at times being the strange people in the community, <laughs> but it builds character if you survive and gives you a lot of spine. And uh, my parents were really full of that kind of spine and vim, vim and vigor and challenging. Uh, my brother will probably talk about speaking truth to power. We were raised on that. And then of course, my father had a little issue when we used it on him. And I used some of his techniques on him once when I wanted to do something and he didn't want me to do it. So I got up early in the morning and I put signs all over the house. God commands you to let Anita go. <laughs> And it worked. <laughs> but then later, my father and mother both said that his children were their best teachers in practicing what they preached. All right. But I am grateful to this day because I feel the character that I am and the strength that I have comes from that initial witnessing and being participating on on the side or the periphery in a way, but that their protest, my brother will tell you he was at, with my mother, with the protests that you were talking about, it was at the defense department, what was it? Atomic Energy Commission. And I remember very clearly because he was only little. He was my little brother and he went with my mother because he couldn't get state. I don't even know where I was or my sisters. 
but I remember there was a little fear then. Most of the time there was excitement, but sometimes there was fear. So in looking at Bill, uh, at, at the book on the golden rule, because like I said, I have no sense of the history of my life, just the events. And I noticed that it was August that the Nevada testing happened. And I remember very, very clearly, we were all carted off to Iowa and dropped off to family members. <laughs> and we had fun, <laughs> but we got little hints and it was always a little on the periphery, like what's happening with the bomb and are they going to be arrested? And, you know, th there were those issues. Again, because it was a cause, I think it built strength in the end, even though there was, you know, worry and anxiety at times, but it builds strength because they were fighting for something bigger than them, bigger than their family, bigger than for the, for the whole globe. And they taught me so many things about organic farming, eating healthy foods, throwing trash in the ocean. I've been an avid recycler since the day I was born, I think. It's ingrained in me, I cannot stand waste. So thank you, Lil and George, because I am, you know, taking my compost on my back to the farmer's market every week. And my sister helped me with that. But anyway, to go back to, so after um, being dropped off with the relatives in Ohio and being picked up and everything was okay, then actually then the next big exciting trip. And it was exciting because this is global. We were being exposed to things that were universal. It wasn't just living in this tiny nuclear family in New Jersey. We were exposed to big ideas, all these names, international travels, people from all cultures. So my memory to some degree, and maybe I have a tendency, I have an issue with my sister. I remember the good things. <laughs> And she remembers other things, <laughs> but we, you know, it's selective memory or it's what I choose to make my history. So I don't know if it's just what I've been told over the years, but we always saw the pictures. We got calls from my father and my father was always joking in a way that he, so this was a six weeks vacation in jail, in the jail in Hawaii. They just had, they were having fun. He always made it seem like it wasn't a tragedy or it wasn't restriction. And then he actually went back to the Hawaiian jail many, many years later and he said, it's not the same. Back then it was early and it was pretty open. And then I also remember that he brought back Moomoo's, the Hawaiian dress for all of us. And a big, I believe it was at that trip, a big lollipop, which at that time, you know, we didn't really eat much sugar and that was a treat, but made me deathly ill. So I never, never again. Um, but just to not take up over my five minutes, this meeting house also has a special meaning because my two daughters, Ariella and Marissa, who are sitting, can you wave your hand? They went to school at Friends Seminary from kindergarten to 12th grade. So we were in here all the time for many events over the years. And one of the things that happened in my family dynamic that George was often the one who went out and did things and Lil stayed home and took care of us. And that was actually really good because we needed a solid nurturing. <laughs> Um, but then when we grew up and flew the coop and were on our own, my mother, Lillian, started to go out and really become more active and find her voice. That's another thing my parents taught me. Find your voice. So I did. I used it against my father. No. <laughs> so find your voice. And I remember, I think it was Marissa, my younger daughter's graduation, sitting in the back with this totally full of um, high school graduates and their parents and their families. And Lillian found her voice and she just 
gave a beautiful speech right in here in the back and about peace and continuity and just, it was absolutely beautiful. So I'm mightily impressed at that time my father was staying home and he said he was taking care of the fire because, you know, the hearth, because only one person could be in jail at a time. Someone had to answer the doorbell for the publicity for the newspapers. <laughs> so anyway, that's just a little bit of my memory um, and my gratitude, actually, even through the hard times, my gratitude for what they really lived with their life, not perfectly but that they really spoke truth to power and they, they lived, they walked the talk, all right? So it's what I attempt to do on my own life, learning from those, that value system. And the last thing I'd like to say before my brother can take over, Alan, is that um, when my father was 95 and my mother had died the year before, he was, up, we were up in Massachusetts together with Alan and his wife, my husband, Jeff, who's sitting right next to my daughter back there, Jeff, who's put up with the Willoughby's for a long time. He came and spent the weekend with us and it was the last weekend of his life. And we happened to be talking that there was a movie called Invictus and we wanted to go to the movies. And he said, Invictus? He said, oh, yeah, he wanted to go. And then he quoted the last two lines to me. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And then he proceeded to tell us his story, that he learned this poem, the whole Invictus poem, when he had run away from home, from his sort of evil father. <laughs> or let's just say angry, very, very angry father. So he ran away from home to Iowa. And it was this poem that he said helped him find his soul. And we went to the movie that night and he said he didn't remember the whole poem, but next to me, when Matt Davin came on and started to recite the poem, he found the words, he held my hands and he recited Invictus from the beginning to the end. And I always say that it took my me till my father was 95 to realize he had a poetic soul. So thank you for uh, thank you. Um, first of all, today I uh, had the Great pleasure with my uh, brother-in-law, Jeff Nadich, to take a ride on the Golden Rule. After uh, 65 years of seeing pictures of it, finally got to see it in the real flesh and blood. And that was pretty exciting, pretty neat to do. Spend a few hours out on the Hudson River. Um, if there is a word to describe the boat, I feel like uh, the word that really comes to mind is, it's a, like, it look, someone asked me like, what were some of my impressions after I got off the boat. And, one thing is it looked bigger in pictures and it looked smaller in real life, but it also looked really solid and really strong. And, and the word that really uh, now comes to mind is it's a very, is the word feisty, it's a feisty boat. And, and I really think that captures its spirit. Um, I prepared, prepared a few thoughts, which I'm gonna sort of formally read to you uh, just about my experiences. Some of it's gonna reflect um, and overlap with what Anita said, but it shouldn't take too long. Growing up with George and Lillian as parents was a gift. The world I was raised in wasn't the typical world of an American middle-class family. It was a 1950, as a 1950s child, I recall our vacations as peace marches, including walking across New Jersey as a part of the San Francisco to Moscow March for world peace. I recall all night vigils in front of the White House a sit-in at the Atomic Energy Commission, which we already talked about, in Germantown, Maryland, a vigil in New London, Connecticut, protesting the launching of nuclear submarines at the New London Naval Submarine Base. By my parents' actions, I learned about standing up for your beliefs and about the difference each of us can make when contributing to make the world a better place to live. 
What really amazes me about my parents was that they never stopped growing and changing. My parents' belief that all people are created equal became a part of the 1960s movement for equal rights and social justice. Later, their concern and vision for the environment and environmental sustainability grew into their worldview and became a part of their values and belief system. Perhaps you could say they were always there, but as they became articulated as parts of movements that happened in our culture, um, you know, you really saw this constant uh, continuing ability to grow right up until they passed away. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, Larry Huntington is the nephew of original crew member William Huntington. Well, what an extraordinary story for in all its aspects. Uh, what I want to share with you is family, personal family recollections and experiences. Uh, I didn't grow up in a family of protesters. I grew up in a family that I think uh, most of us would have thought was reasonably conventional. And uh, early on, my father and his one year younger brother, Bill, were very close and uh, they were followed by another brother. And the three of them were raised by a very strong mother, their father having died uh, when they were pretty young. So these boys, three boys grew up and one became an Episcopalian, my father, like his mother. Bill became a Quaker to his mother's concern. And Chris, the youngest, became a Catholic priest. And so these boys, all very strong-willed, grew up and found themselves on the edge of World War II the oldest and the youngest went into the Navy and Bill became a conscientious objector and was sent to a, a internment camp in Northern New York with his wife and three young daughters. And they spent the war years in, in re real poverty in this very Spartan, uh, internment camp in northern New York, a tough, tough time, but also a time that uh, stressed the understanding between the two brothers and their very strong mother. Uh, I grew up listening to part of that. I was too young to really comprehend anything other than to know that it was tough. Um, come along the 50s, and Bill went off to Nevada and protested, the, as we've been hearing this afternoon. And he went to jail, and his two brothers were horrified and, and really quite upset. And that's the part of the family involvement that, that uh, I witnessed, because that's what I would hear in, in at my family's dinner table. So when the Golden Rule project came alive and Bill signed on and was obviously a, a, a good deal part of the thinking that uh, went into it and co-leading with uh, Albert Bigelow, his older brother, my father, was more than distressed and pleaded with him not to do this and said that as a naval officer, as a former naval officer, he had an obligation to try to convince people in Washington to stop the golden rule. He was obviously not successful and I don't know how far his efforts went, but they put a fundamental strain on the relationship between these two very close brothers. So I can only imagine how hard it was for Bill. Uh, he had 
uh, demonstrated uh, and protested and done things that uh, were already in his life, done things that were dramatically unconventional. And here he was uh, not being supported by his two, two siblings. And I know my grandmother, she was tough. Uh, she, I'm sure, didn't support it. So uh, Bill managed through this and came out with his head high. As most of you know, he then took on the, the job in Europe of managing the Friends uh, rehabilitation effort so that he and his family lived in, in Europe for quite a few years. Uh, he later went on to be the Quaker representative to the UN and did that for, I think, as much as five years. Uh, he was a remarkable man. He was a towering intellect, unbelievably, unbelievably smart. Uh, he, was, he was trained as an architect, and what most people don't know is that uh, that's how he earned his living. And somehow, in all of these activities around, in Nevada, in Honolulu, Europe, UN, in between each of these enterprises, he would suddenly, the next day, have a client and start doing architecture. And I, I would go by his office. I, I really loved my Uncle Bill, and I would visit with him quite often. And I would go into his, his architectural office, and there he would be beavering away, designing a house for somebody. And I said, how the hell did you get a client? You've been in Europe for five years. He said, oh, I don't know. They just call up. <laughs> but he was able to do that. In and out of these enterprises, he would come back and spend three or four years designing buildings and making a living, and then go off again to these enterprises. Uh, final an anecdote. Um, I ran into Bill in the early 60s, I guess it was 63, 64, at a dinner. Something else was going on, and uh, we fell to talking. Uh, the dinner was pretty boring, and I don't even remember what it was about, but we fell to talking, and I said, you know, Bill, you paved the way for the extraordinary protests that were now taking place over the Vietnam War. And he said something like, this is not a direct quote, but something like, I never thought I'd hear a member of my own family say that. I, I neglected to introduce two descendants or uh, relatives of Bill. Please stand up. Uh, Adri Adrian Truini is Bill's grandson, lives here in New York. And Christopher Huntington, my son, Bill's great nephew, also living in New York. Thank you, all the family members who are here tonight. That was lovely. Um, we're going to hear from Helen Jackard, the manager, one of the, one of the managers of this whole golden rule thing that's going on now to bring us kind of up to date on what's been happening. And I don't know if there are other crew members here, but you'll introduce them if they are, right? Thank you. This is such a treat. The whole Golden Rule story is so complex and the whole Golden Rule family just keeps growing and growing for me. You know, I, my husband and I showed up in the boatyard when the Golden Rule was just about ready to be finished. Just Veterans for Peace put out a call for people to come sand and paint and varnish and get her ready to, to put, be put back in the water. And I like to do that stuff so we, moved our RV, which we were living in full time, into the boatyard of where the Golden Rule was being rebuilt. And as a matter of course, we read Bigelow's book, you know, The Voyage of the Golden Rule, an experiment with truth. And soon after 
um, I'll, I'll tell you how actually, actually I came to be in this place um, was that I, I had been a computer programmer and I put up a, a form on the web um, for a crew application form and I tested it and was shocked a month later when the crew selection committee said they were thinking about me for the maiden voyage. And I said, what are you thinking? I've never even been on a sailboat. And they said, well, you're gonna be with three good sailors, but we need a public speaker. And I said, I've never done that either. And they just kind of blew it off and said, oh, you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> so off I went on the first uh, voyage of the Golden Rule. And I, I was all, almost always crew for the first eight years. Um, it became kind of like a calling, you know, well, who's going to do this? Something needs to be done. Uh, well, I guess I'm available. So that's what I've been doing for the last eight years of my life. Um, so in 2015, we launched the Golden Rule, and I discovered how big the Golden Rule family was during that launch party. Around 400 people came. Now, how many of you came to Samoa, California? No? There was a whole room full of family members of the original crew that gave talks that day. So now I'm meeting the rest of rest of you all. So anyway, now you're all part of the Golden Rule family, of course. But welcome. So uh, the film was made in 2017, as, as I said. And after that, we spent some time getting the Golden Rule ready for this very big trip to Japan. Uh, we really wanted to go to the Marshall Islands. So we did make it to Hawaii. There were two or three or four attempts to get there, but we finally did. And we sailed all around the Hawaiian Islands, learning all about the way the military had, US military had taken over the Hawaiian Islands. And then um, we got to Honolulu finally, and we were about to sail on to the Marshall Islands. And unfortunately it was March, 2020, and we weren't going anywhere because the countries were closing down. Everybody was wearing masks, it was COVID time. So we couldn't go to the Marshall Islands or anywhere else. And we decided finally that we would bring the golden rule back to California and weren't sure what we were gonna do with it after that. Um, one person I'd like to, this is a good time to just say that um, Captain Kiko Johnston Kitazawa, who um, led the, the team from Hawaii back to California is um, our upcoming captain again. So, <laughs> yeah, he's, he sailed with us quite a bit around Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands before bringing her back and helping her to be put on a truck and, and moved to Minneapolis. So that was the thing is, what do we do now with the golden rule, this icon of peace and disarmament? We decided to fulfill the, villa, the vision of the people who'd spent five years rebuilding her. And so, we decided they, they wanted to take her through all the navigable waters of the United States. That's a pretty big mission, but well, there's this thing called the Great Loop. And usually you go start somewhere along the loop, you go down the center of the country around the tip of Florida, up in the East Coast in three or four different ways into the Great Lakes and make your way back down out of Chicago, back down the center of the country, right? You don't usually start in Minneapolis. You can't get there from the other end, it's a trickle. So, <laughs> so but we did. Uh, we have a great chapter of Veterans for Peace there. We started in Minneapolis, went down the center of the country, around the tip of Florida. Um, for most of that time, Captain Kiko was our captain and he took us to Cuba and back. Thank you, Kiko. And now we're sailing up the East Coast and we'll go all the way up past Portland, Maine so we can do a little protesting in Bath, Maine. Uh, that will be towards the end of June. 
Yes. Um, so a lot of different places we're going to go. And then we're coming back to New York. We're just going to sail kind of through it so we can get it back into the Hudson River, go through the Erie Canal, the Oswego Canal, come out in Lake Ontario and sail the Great Lakes and then come out in Chicago like you normally would. So it's, it's an 11,000 mile, more than a year long voyage. We'll be in more than a hundred cities and towns. New ones get added all the time, it seems. I gotta learn how to say no to all of that. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a huge enterprise, but the, it's so meaningful and every place is unique. Like we went to Dubuque, Iowa. Well, what's in Dubuque? Marshallese. There's a group of 800 or 1,000 Marshallese immigrants there. And when they found out the story about the Golden Rule in the Phoenix, and that the Golden Rule was coming to their town, they showed up and they sang songs in their traditional costumes. And that was a really special visit. So they got to see the boat and get on it. And, and so that was really great. And then um, another special time was going to Washington, DC. You know. This is the only time the golden rule will probably ever be there. Our nation's capital. So what do we do? Veterans for Peace wrote a nuclear posture review, which analyzed all of the relationships between the United States and the other nuclear armed nations plus Iran, and decided that there are ways that we could negotiate a peace, a disarmament with the rest of the nuclear armed countries. So when people ask me, what about Iran? What about North Korea? What about Russia and China? Every single one of those relationships could be improved by listening to what their concerns are and helping to protect the, everyone's security and needs. So there's another way, there's a peaceful way out of having nuclear arms. And the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Posture Review shows us that way. So we gave one of those to every Senator and member of Congress. <laughs> Have any of you ever walked to the halls of Congress? Wow, you know, I'm, I'm a West Coaster. I had no idea what that was all about. It's a big deal. You know, and then we come to New York. We have the United Nations here. What a special place. So yesterday we went to the Mexican mission and there were, I don't know, 12 or 13 other missions there. We talked all about nuclear disarmament and the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. What a special time. And then we, then we went and um, visited the Republic of the Marshall Islands mission. Wow. The ambassador there, she gave us a couple of hours of our time, of her time, so we could just sit and talk with her. What an amazing thing. So, you know, now I can't wait to continue on and meet all the rest of the cool people that we're going to see. Every stop is unique and, and fantastic. So I am, you know, the thing is, everywhere we go, there are people like Anthony Donovan planning a series of events. And we're so grateful. There's no way we can do it without all of you all. So if you know somebody in one of the cities we're going to be in, give us a shout. I'll put you in contact with some of the main organizers. They all need help. They all need to incorporate more organizations as, as co-sponsors to all of their events, get more people to come to the events. This is a great turnout, by the way. We're, I'm really, really happy to see so many people come here. So um, I'm, I'm assuming there's more things to the program. I wanted to introduce one more crew member, Ren Jacob. This is Ren's fourth tour of duty with um, the Golden Rule. And let's see, I wanna introduce Ed Mays as our videographer. He's been with us for nearly two months. Thank you, Ed. He's been producing a whole remarkable series of videos that um, you can find on Ed Mays or Pirate TV on YouTube, and they'll be on our, our Facebook page and our website, so you can see some of the really special things we've been doing, like the investigation of military poisons in the Potomac River. 
So we had a lot of speakers talk about all the various places, including the fact that the Potomac River, if you don't know, is a firing range. So we're dropping ordnance in there, some of it unexploded. Um, and one other special person I'd really like to introduce is the president of the Golden Rule Committee. He's on the National Board of Directors of Veterans for Peace and a former president of Veterans for Peace and my husband, Jerry Condon. <laughs> Jerry's the one that got me into all this trouble in the first place. When I met him in 2006, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a peace movement. I got quite the education. Oh, and one other thing about being here. This is a really special place. Tomorrow starts Fleet Week, and there's a parade of, of uh, military uh, ships going right past Chelsea Piers, where we are. So we thought it might be kind of fun, you know, to go in front of those big old military weapons of mass destruction with our cool sails, uh, like we've done five times on the West Coast. I didn't imagine we were going to be able to do this on the East Coast, but I think we've got a crew to, that's uh, willing to do that and get into that sort of fun. So um, <laughs> if you want to come early to Chelsea Piers and just um, on 59th, um, Pier, Pier 59, you can stand up there and take pictures with the golden rule in the foreground and some of the military boats going by in the background. So we're going to probably launch about 8 o'clock, 7.30, something like that in the morning. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to let people get on with the program. Okay, we're almost there. We're going to bring up that Anthony Donovan, who's done all this organizing and scheduling in New York City for a, a short public service announcement. And then we're going to have a little time for Q&A. Right. Yes, yes. Actually, I'm going to take about 30 minutes. Is that right? <laughs> um, no, the important thing is to move to Q&A. That, that'd be just special. Um, but I, I, I do need to say a few words. We hear about sailing, and it sounds great, right? Oh, sailing around the country, right? Sailing around the country, it sounds really cool, right? Well, I really have to hand it to the captains and the crew, Ren. It is really tough in this little boat. This is a tough boat. Um, Alan, you mentioned it's a feisty boat. My, my feeling is this such a tough boat, and you are very brave, courageous souls going through the Pacific Ocean is no joke. It's 30 foot waves and winds and gales. You can read that boat a little bit about it. So these are very brave human beings. They're doing a very brave thing. We are in the middle of a, another nuclear arms race, full speed ahead, pouring more money into this para, our money. So. This boat, to me, brings, and, and Helen and, and you, Jerry, especially, they've been doing this for years, going from meeting to meeting, city to city, town to town, uh, just sharing why we don't want these weapons and we don't want war and how they believe in embracing cultures. I, I have so enjoyed uh, today watching Alan, uh, Willoughby, and... Uh, and you, Larry, take off on that boat. It, it, it meant the world. And I know that with Captain Kiko and with Helen uh, and with Ren back here, uh, it was so moving watching that boat pull off the dock and, and just feeling your, your father and uh, your uncle. How powerful. Uh, I want to also call out another person in this room, Walter Nagel. Yeah, Walter. Walter, you want to raise your hand? I just, Bayard's husband and, and partner, God bless you. Uh, Bayard's a very important part going back to the 40s in this home here, in this Quaker home. And I really also, if, while this hat is going around, I really want to call attention to the War Resisters League 100 years. I, as a teenager, with the Vietnam War going on, 
and thinking about being drafted. It was such, when I met people from the War Resisters League, it was, uh, I felt these are people that know, these are people with experience about what I'm going through here. And so I really, really have such a deep thanks my early and the FOR and the Quakers who gave me my first trainings as a 17 year old in nonviolence. I didn't know what nonviolence was. I felt pretty angry about things. So FOR and the Quakers, you are like the roots, even though as a Catholic kid, um, you really brought that those teachings, which are essential. Uh, so I thank in this very special home here. Thank you. Uh, Quakers for bringing that important teaching of how to how to handle what's going on today. It's going on right now. War. Let me, I don't have to speak. We have a huge war that is threatening the entire world right now. It's happening again and again. So how do we remain our how do we keep our composure? How do we decide what is best for the world and yet still be a good human being and not give in to the despair? anger, the hatred. So you have helped me channel and move in that direction. And that's the golden rule. What a light this boat is for me. Uh, I remember the two really essential New York City people in the Veterans for Peace could not be here tonight due to illness. But uh, Tarak Kauf of the New York chapter of Veterans for Peace and uh, and the, and the president of uh, National Veterans for Peace, Susan Schnall, they both could not be here. They send their they send their love to everyone here, and uh, I forget what I was going to say about them. But anyway, they are they're with. Oh, I remember three or four years ago when we first got the call in Susan's room about gee, you know the that golden rule has been turned back, and they're thinking about this this great loop thing and you know and we're like you mean they might come to the east coast and we were just i would just remember being so thrilled like wow it was a ray of hope of light things are pretty bad right now folks and i don't have to tell anyone in this room about it because i'm happy to be in a room of people i don't have to explain how bad things are right now and where our money is going it's really an honor and this is how we stay, this community. So God bless. Uh, thank you for giving me this time. And thank you. That's something different. That's for the Veterans for Peace. Memorial Day, Veterans for Peace. We'll be there. We'll see you there. God bless. Thank you. Is there a website where we could follow the path of the Golden Rule when it goes up the East River and uh, along Long Island? You can always follow the golden rule if you go to our website, vfpgoldenrule.org. There's a link to our tracker. Every 10 minutes, a dot goes on a map and you can see where we've been and where we are. And you can kind of predict when we're going to get to somewhere that way. That's what we always do as shore support to follow the golden rule. Um, there's so much going on in the world today. So many problems, and we've alluded to it. Not alluded, we've we've mentioned them. How do you separate the goals of the Golden Rule from everything else, or how do you combine them? How do you get the word out? Because we all here, I mean, everyone here already knows. How about the rest of us? We do a lot of things to reach the rest of the world. We we do our best to be in the newspapers. So, you know, for each one of you, there's probably a thousand people that have now read about us, like in the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Baltimore Sun. Who knows? Maybe someday we'll be in the New York Times. So um, newspapers are one way, and radios and um, TV shows, um, often people will show up. Also, we, you know, raise our sales in public wherever we can. So that means people are seeing us. And sometimes, like, uh, hopefully tomorrow morning, when we go out and sailing, there'll be some people passing out some flyers saying, what's that boat out there and why are they there? You know, they're, they're there to bring attention to this weapons of mass destruction in our cities, making us seem like that's a good and normal maybe thing, right? No, it's not. We don't need to be celebrating weapons of war. 
So um, also we've been in four wooden boat shows and we go into schools or we have school children come and see the golden rule and tell the story that way. So there's a lot of different things we're trying to do to um, involve ordinary people. Sometimes it'll be like the Green Party will host us or Democratic Socialists of America. Oftentimes we'll be welcomed by indigenous leaders. In fact, that's gonna happen quite a bit in the upcoming um, events that, that are being planned. So any community that we can reach, we're happy to. We talk at Hiroshima and Nagasaki Day commemorations sometimes. Um, I was honored to be the keynote speaker a few years ago at the Maui um, uh, Hiroshima Day commemoration. Do you have a question? I do. Stand up so they know who you are. I shall. Helen, you told us about the renovation of the boat. Tell us about the building of the original boat. I believe it was built in Costa Rica. It's made of wood and it's a very nice special kind of mahogany that's really well suited for boats. Um, wooden boats are, have a special design, at least this kind of wooden boat. It's a, it's a frame. So you've got ribs and planks over the ribs and between the planks you pound in bunches of cotton. Um, but the boat's basically the same as it was then. It's just, we saved the planks and, and the ribs. I mean, that part of it was, is the original, except for the two holes in the side when she sank. Um, I mean, do we know who built it? I don't know. I don't know if uh, Bigelow said in his book, and I, I don't think so. Hi, uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, opportunity for us to listen for these great people who did this great thing. Um, I recently got a little bit uh, more awareness, a little lower, okay. Um, I became a member of, um, the, the, I, I can do it, an uh, organization, international organization against nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear bomb. H however, uh, the, there's an issue attached to it nowadays. It makes it a little bit complicated. Um, I'm totally against the bomb, and I don't want to, and the wonderful work is a great example, but um, I happen to be a Quaker who also believes that we need to involve nuclear energy to help negate, negate the uh, climate disaster, which is coming upon us. And uh, so I am one of the Quakers with a, a pro peaceful, a peaceful nuclear uh, war. Now the UN is also pro nuclear and they are also against and wonderful, probably part of your work is the result in the in the UN resolution to abolish and make uh, nuclear wars illegal. So I thank you for that, setting the, setting the, the, th the thing in motion. Thank you. We have worked with um, indig indigenous people of the United States who are affected by the 15,000 abandoned uranium mines in 15 Western states and have come to understand the connection between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. So they start out from the same thing, mining uranium, which is very destructive to the land and to the health of the people near the mines. And it goes on towards the processing, which doesn't always stay at the processing plants, right? And uses a whole lot of energy in the mining and the processing. So it's not even um, reasonable regarding the amount of carbon used for getting to the point where you can either use the weapons or use the nuclear fuel and you have to keep more mining going on to get new clean uranium and processing that. So it's not carbon free whatsoever. Also, nuclear weapons take a long time to come online and they're very expensive and they're always running over budget and over time. So it's nuclear power plants, I'm sorry. It's too little too late. Um, there's a whole lot of other things going on like you can use the 
the um, irradiated fuel rods, which produces plutonium and extract that plutonium to use as the core of nuclear bombs. That was the original reason that nuclear power first came into being. Atoms for Peace was a big PR lie. It's a hell of a way to boil water, is what a lot of people say. Yeah. So um, I'm not in favor of nuclear energy, and I don't think it's a solution to the climate crisis. Could you tell the story? Please tell the story of the invasion of the Marine base by the Golden Rule. <laughs> if you don't, I will. <laughs> I think you're going to have to tell about that. What are you talking about? I'm from Baltimore, and I was very involved in the, in the arrangements for the DC Baltimore area of the Golden Rule a few weeks ago. And one day they were sailing toward DC from further south and it was a terrible stormy day and very cold and the crew got totally sopping wet. And one of the volunteer crew, cause there'd been some COVID. And so several people had had to leave and some local volunteers had come on. And one of them has circulatory problems anyway. So his feet and hands, he couldn't feel. Them. And they were passing the Quantico Marine Base which is also the FBI training school. Quantico is full of questionable stuff. And they called the emergency crew and went in and tied up there because they couldn't go any farther. This little peace boat invaded this terrible Marine base. And the next day they took, they had taken all the clothes from the man who was suffering from possible hypothermia. They washed them and dried them and brought them back folded. And so, <laughs> the headline for his little article about it, or I gave him the headline. His headline was kind of innocuous, but I changed it to, Peace Boat Invades Marine Base, Gets Folded Laundry Back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, else? Thank you, that was a, a, a pretty serious storm that came and forced them into taking safe harbor at Quantico Marine Base. Hello, I'm Reverend Billy. I'm, um, I'm mindful of the Golden Rule's impact on protesters right now in our city who are stuck. It's a hard time. It's a, it's a, a difficult time, the atmosphere. Jordan Neely and his murder right over here at the F train. I took it to get here. Um, we, we don't have a clear path right now. And it feels as if since Black Lives Matter, since the, three years ago, uh, that we just uh, are battered by the fossil fuel banks and by all neo neo neoliberal capitalism is just uh, so so tough. And the NYPD has now got a budget of a billion dollars a month. Um, the golden rule, rule uh, a small boat, a notion of combating the biggest power, the people who won, who conquered the new superpower, the United States in the 50s. And they take that boat and aim it where this incredible weapon that the world is in awe of is being exploded. And I just think it's an inspiration to all, all of us who must risk arrest who must find a creative way to go forward right now. I'm just grateful. Yeah, but I'm grateful. I hope that we've given you some hope that people are working to stop the possibility of nuclear war and it can be done. And if we all believe that it can be done, it's more likely that it will happen. Thank you. Thank you.